Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Good morning. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and Full Stature Ministries. We're happy to see you, everybody here in the room today. And, uh, we're glad that you guys can tune in on, online and, and watch us as well. We thank you for supporting us um, in the ministry. We have been talking about in the last couple weeks um, this is part three, so if you're joining us for part three, it'll be somewhat positive. <laughs> I don't know where it'll all fit in for you, but uh, for the sake of for the sake of time, I'm gonna bre- I'm gonna go over the last week's message very briefly. Um, last week we, we we're talking about why ask why and the overweight brain, and last week was when the whys lead to to deconstruction. Um, We talked about three fears that that a lot of people um, have a hard time with and they start asking why because of the three fears. The main ones were the fear of the unattainable, the fear of the uncontrollable, and the fear of the unknowable. The fear of the unattainable affects identity. It impacts our emotions. The fear of uncontrollable is a fear that affects our will. It's, the, it's where we start worrying and try to getting everything back into control. If we worry about something enough, right, it'll, it'll fix it, right? No. Fear of the unknowable is what a lot of the, the questions, the why questions come from. I need all the answers in order to feel safe, or I need all the answers in order to move on. We talked a little bit about deconstruction in the way that, the, um, in a Christian aspect of deconstruction in today's context would be to... Um, Basically, take apart everything that you believe, one brick at a time. And um, unfortunately, with deconstruction in the, in the context that we hear nowadays, that that movement doesn't really primarily focus on reconstruction. It only leads to more turmoil and uh, questions and and what have you. But what today um, uh, we talked about the origin story, the, the Satan's rebellion was actually the first deconstruction, and how he. Uh, how it was mirrored in Adam and Eve in the first fall, um, and we went over that. So we had a lot of a lot of good information in last week's. So if you you haven't um, uh, listened to that, go go back and and you know go back and listen to that because I, I can't explain it all today. I got too much stuff, too too much good stuff, right? Um, one of the interesting things that I came across was just to give you an overall picture of of I guess the whys of some of the people's reasoning behind their deconstruction and reconstruction. Um, the top ten, based on what I've studied, and, I, and I've gone, th- I've had at least half a dozen books, and I did a lot of studying online um, to come up with this series. Um, and what I found was most of the top ten things. Um, our ministry takes care of like no problem, <laughs> which is awesome because we're a discipling church. We, we are an equipping church, and that's what usually helps. But for the most part, first, number one, biggest one, unresolved pain and suffering. Unresolved meaning they don't have the answers to why I'm, I'm having pain or why there is pain, why there is suffering. Um, and along with that, it's usually um, hurt that came from or in the church in a religious aspect to it. That's more, that's like 20% or more of, of the, the, the number one, uh, that's basically the number one reason for, for um, deconstructing your faith and leaving the faith altogether. Uh, the second one is intellectual doubts, the things that, you know, confliction, you know, conflicting data that you study in, this, in the scriptures that you think is conflicting um, or that other people have brought up, you know, that you've studied. Um, the other one would be disappointment to God's response to suffering, which again, that's ties into the first one. 
Um, and another one would be the desire for personal autonomy. I don't want to be lorded over. I don't want to answer to, to I want to be my, my own authority in my life. Um, those would be the top five or the top ten. I'm not going to go into all the top tens because I, I have a lot of other things that, that need to be um, hit on. But you see that right there, just those five is 10, 20, 30, 40, 47, 50, 50 that's like 67% of why people walk out of their faith. And that's disturbing, right? But today I wanna to actually talk about what I would call from wonder to unbelief. And it would be like the, 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 the process of, from our personal, not just our, you know, this is all our personal experiences here, but the process of uh, being possibly raised in a Christian family, learning the Christian values, um, even learning how to abide and, and everything, top, top of the world. Um, but then, of course, then something happens, disappointing. Something disappointing. I, I, I have questions, and I start breaking it down from wonder to unbelief. And that was kind of like what I covered last week, but this, I want to show you how well uh, one particular Lots of people have had these experiences. I mean, lots. Um, but what I what I wanted to show you this week was there's a lot of people that came back. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you some individuals that actually had the experience of the profound journey of falling out of their faith, and yet having their faith restored and renewed in in a different way. Um, even one of the notable examples that I read about was was John Newton, who after you know he was a life as a he was a slave trader, right? And what ended up coming out of him was amazing grace. He had a radical life transformation after that. Um, Blaise Pascal, the brilliant mathematician, he experienced a deep transformation that reignited his faith. Even Martin Luther, and we talk about Martin Luther, as a, he was the Reformation guy, right? Well, he had struggles significant struggles with doubt before immersing himself in scripture and reigniting that. Um, so nobody really talks about that part too often. Um, in the more contemporary times, you have Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was one of the, one of the, the people of the case for Christ. He was a, an investigator that events, eventually in, investigated him, himself out of atheism, right? It was really cool. It's, a, it's an awesome story. Um, Abby Johnson was the former uh, Planned Parenthood director that underwent dramatic change in her belief. Um, Jackie Hill Perry, I don't know if you, anybody knows much about her. She's pretty popular right now. Um, she was a former lesbian, atheist, um, but she was, they all started out as, as Christian and grew up in Christian families and have that, you know, that, that, that structure in their life and they fell away. Because of usually what I just talked about, they, they encountered some type of pain and suffering or questions about it um, that, that they couldn't get a relief or you know, a good answer for. Um, well, anyway, but even when we were, I was looking at those, I was like, well, give me some good examples in Scripture. There's a lot of people that ask why questions, and I talked about that last week. There's a ton of people that ask why questions in the Scriptures. And, and a lot of times, they, I mean... It, you know, they ended up with working it out with God. Some of them end up, wrote, you know, writing in the Gospels. Um, one, of the, one of the people that I noticed this time around when I was studying was John Mark. He actually, he, 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 he gave up halfway through his, his walk with, with Jesus. He was like, okay, I had enough. I don't know if anybody, I mean, do you know that? That that actually happened? In Acts 13, Paul had a little had a little spat with his uncle Barnabas at the time. He was like, Barnabas wants to take him along with us to, to I think it was Papyrus. I don't remember the name of the town. I don't even know how to say it. But he wanted to take him with him, and he was like, nah, we're going to leave him here. And it caused a, you know, a division between Barnabas and, and Paul at the time. But then somewhere between that particular scripture in Acts 13 into 2 Timothy, there had to have been 
some are that he reconstructed his his faith. Well, first of all, he wrote the gospel. But second, it was um, Paul that was like, he was in prison in 2 Timothy, uh, or in 4.11, I think. He said <clears throat> in one of his letters, make sure that you, you bring Mark with you because he is very useful for me in the ministry. So something happened in his life, and I would love to know the, the background in, you know, in, in that if, if it's ever written somewhere, right? That would be so cool. But what I want to talk about today was something that mirrored very closely um, my explanation of um, an overall picture of what happens um, from, you know, Christian faith and then, and then all the way to uh, completely un complete unbelief in God. Um, and and I'll, I'll, just get, I'll just get into it because it, it, I thought it was fascinating the way that it followed the same script that I was teaching. And it was a person that really existed, and most of you know him. This story is a young man. It's about a young man who was raised in a Christian home. His parents were both devout Christians with a strong appreciation for books, learning, and intellectual discourse. His mother was the daughter of a clergyman in the church, and she instilled in him a respect for the Bible and Christian values from an early age. Her influence was gentle yet profound. She taught the boy about the natural world and often connected it to a sense of wonder about God's creation. The family attended a local Protestant church in Ireland, and the young man grew up surrounded by the rhythms of church life, such as Sunday worship services, the teachings of Scripture, and Christian holidays. The Bible, of course, was a central part of their home, and he was familiar with its stories and moral teachings. Both his parents encouraged him to read widely, and at an, <clears throat> at an early age, this included uh, Christian literature, classic myths in the Bible. However, his Christian upbringing wasn't solely intellectual. It was embedded in an everyday practice, practicing the values of his family, which emphasized prayer, moral discipline, and reverence and the fear of the Lord. As a child, he experienced Christianity as a foundational part of his world. However, when his mom's illness struck, the young man watched helplessly as her health declined. He became desperate for a miracle. He prayed fervently, hoping that God would intervene and heal her, but his prayers went unanswered, and this experience planted the seeds of doubt and despair that would take him down a deep, dark spiral. He later described this period of time in his life that he felt that the, the first stirrings of anger and confusion towards God, the God he had been taught to trust, seemed in that moment distant and indifferent. His young mind struggled to reconcile the idea of a loving, powerful God with the profound loss and suffering that he felt. With her death, the warmth and comfort of home life also began to erode. His father was deeply affected as well. And, the, <clears throat> and though he loved his sons, he struggled to cope with his grief. His father became emotionally distant and erratic, retreating to his, in his own sorrow, which left him and his older brother to face their loss largely alone. For the young man, this emotional withdrawal from his father compounded the wound of losing his mother. He once wrote that he felt as though the safety net of his childhood had been ripped away, and he began to develop a sense of emotional detachment, self-reliance, and the shape of his relationships and worldview began to change. Soon after his mother's death, he was sent away to a boarding school, one of a few. The school environment was harsh and unsupportive, and he felt abandoned and alone. He also became sick at that time, um, having to go board back and forth through a couple of different boarding schools. And this experience drove him further into isolation. And, you know, he had a sense of bitterness, which caused him to distance himself from the Christian faith that he had known as a child. He began to view religion as powerless and inadequate, unable to offer the comfort that he once hoped it could provide. 
This formative experience of loss, loneliness, and unanswered prayer left him with a profound hurt that he carried into adulthood. The grief and disappointment he felt as a boy became kind of a spiritual scar, and it fueled his later years of atheism and intellectual skepticism. Ultimately, his mother's death was a turning point that forced him to grapple the questions of pain and God, themes that would later become central to his writings. Now, many of his friends and family knew this boy as Jack, but for the rest of the world, we know him as none other than C.S. Lewis. His reflections on suffering, especially the books like Problem, The Problem of Pain and A Grief Observed, reveal the deep wounds that were held closely to him and were an early loss, an eventual journey to reconcile those wounds within a renewed relationship with God came about after. It's interesting to see the way that he came down that spiral the same way that many of, well, up to 67%, according to the statistics, right, fall down from. It always starts with pain. Whether they want to admit it or not, if you're struggling with it, you don't even have to, I mean, you have to admit your pain eventually in order to get back to God. But if it's somebody that you're, you're talking to, understand that most of the time they will deny that. And it will just be the questions that are unanswered and the things that they come up with, the facts that you can't fix. It will become more of an argument than, than, than a witnessing element, right? And trying to get them to, to get help. He questioned God's goodness and authority, right? He sought control through reason. And then he descended into disillusionment and despair. He followed the exact program in his life. He also then embraced autonomy, self-reliance. I, I don't want anybody to be over me. I don't want the Bible to have rule over me, and I don't want to have God rule over me. I want to be able to figure this out myself, my own spiritual journey, right? <laughs> now, this is the thing. In his final descent, Lewis chose to fully reject Christianity. Not, you know, not everybody does. But he would no longer rely on God or faith, but his own intellect. Like many who reached this stage of deconstruction, he took on a self-determined approach to truth. No longer willing to submit to an authority he could not, he could not trust. He constructed his own worldview based on secular philosophy and human reason. He was a big reader. But here he did find temporary relief. It just felt empty. He, would, he later wrote at this time as the path to hell, though <clears throat> he, would, he would eventually achieve intellectual freedom. It came at a cost, the cost of emotional isolation, bitterness, and deep emptiness. That's what everybody has to expect down here, no matter what type of relief you get, eventually is that there's a deep emptiness and bitterness can grow. Yet Lewis's life didn't end there, right? His story didn't end there. The path led him that, that led him to atheism, but eventually it didn't give him peace, so he found his way back. Um, it was only years after wrestling with this darkness that Lewis would encounter God anew, not through a list of answers to his why questions. He didn't get all his why questions answered. He didn't get his, why, why do I have pain? Why do we have suffering in a world? He didn't get his answers answered. But it was through a surrender to God who surpasses all human understanding. Lewis' eventual journey back to faith shows us that while deconstruction can lead to unbelief, it can also be the beginning of reformation if we allow it to point to God instead of away from him, right? And this is where we start, the journey back, the pathway home, right? When we're, when we're in deconstruction and we are in the process of going into unbelief because we're, we feel broken and betrayed, we feel anxiety, we feel loneliness, vulnerability, depression, 
when we're in this and we're going towards this route here, this is where people mess up. The exposure to others. What happens is, is when we get, we get so depressed, that we eventually say, somebody else has got to be experiencing the same thing, right? So then we go online and we search and we, we do all these horrible things and look at TikTok shows and podcasts on how people deconstructed their faith and how Christianity means nothing. And I mean, there's a ton of awful stuff out there. How to deconstruct, you know, uh, it's, it's just awful. It, it was a very hard message last week. Studying for this was rough. But what, what I found, all of the people that I listed up there, anybody that you find that actually comes out is always, there's always an option here. No matter where you are down here, the option here is ex not exposure to others, but exposure to God. That takes, that takes a little bit of work, though. Something happens there. For C.S. Lewis, the journey back to faith was not easy or immediate, and after years of walking the path of unbelief, reasoning away his pain, and embracing the world without God, Lewis began to feel an emptiness that even his intellect couldn't feel. <laughs> what do you know? Eventually, that happened. His rejection of faith, while logical, led him spiritually destitute. But in his despair... He found himself longing for something more, and this longing was the beginning of the Reformation process in his life. A longing for more. Not the longing for understanding why more, but the longing for there's more to this life than just reading and learning about stuff, right? That doesn't save you. In his years of unbelief, Lewis described himself as a reluctant atheist, writing that he was very angry with God for not existing. <laughs> but this paradox revealed his inner turmoil, right? He struggled to understand why he still felt anger toward God that he claimed he did not believe in, but he realized that his atheism had not satisfied him. We have internally something that is created by God that only He can fit in. There's a space in us that only He can fit in. And when we don't have that in our life, there's going to be a searching no matter what. There always is. It just how, how long do you, you know, uh, want to wait to fill that void, right? He realized that atheism had not satisfied him. It left him as he put it, in a heart crying out for joy, but unable to find the source. This is the heart of the subjunctive mood, a place where hope has been deferred and the heart is sick. This would be in the, the subjunctive mood, in the area of doubt and deconstructing right here, and also pointing down here. It's because the hope is deferred. His intellect and self-reliance left him restless and dissatisfied, and in time he began to sense that his denial of God that he created in an unbearable, it, it, it became an unbearable emptiness in him. And in this dark place, a glimmer of doubt about his doubts began to arise. <laughs> Somebody helped him with that. Do you know who it was? Any J.R.R. Tolkien fans out there? Pretty interesting, huh? Who God puts in your life. Okay, so a glimmer of hope. What happened was he realized there was a realization, and this happens to a lot of these, these folks that I, that I listed off even at the beginning, that there is something I'm missing. I'm missing something. And so there's a searching then that opens the door to... The optative mood. Optative mood is hope. There's open and open and hope, right? There's a, there's an open door, willingness to say, "Hey, I, I got something I can't fix. No matter what, I can't fill this void. There's something missing, and I want it 
filled. Moved him into a place of hope. The optative mood, as we've discussed, is where hope begins to reemerge. It's the shift from demanding answers to opening oneself up to the possibility that God might be real after all. If you're atheist, you know, there's a possibility you never know. What do you know? Then that right there takes a little bit of humility, but we'll get into that. For Lewis, this shift was gradual, uh, born out of his longing for joy, which is, where's joy? On the other chart? It's up here. It's where we start. It's the indicative mood. That's part of the joy is a fruit of the spirit that you cannot experience outside of God. You can't. And, and it's so interesting that he longed for it. There was something there. It wouldn't satisfy him. And he wanted joy, but he couldn't get it because there was no source. And he could never locate a source with his intellect. This realization he said, after thinking about this and what he was feeling, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world could satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I wasn't made for this world. I was made for another world. Interesting. Pretty interesting concept, thinking things through. This realization marked his move into the optative mood. <clears throat> his move into the optative mood where he began to doubt his doubts and entertain the possibility that his longing for joy might actually point to God. Surrendering control, the shift from self-reliance to the dependence on God. How do we do that? How do we, how do we get out from self-reliance self to dependence on God? Well, the, the overweight brain and all that, we need a diet change. We need to stop feeding it the, the certain things that we, you know, per, certain podcasts that we listen to and things like that. We need to definitely change our diet. <clears throat> What's funny is it reminded me when, when I, was, I was writing this, uh, the first round, uh, I was remembering that the, the times that I took my kids to the store when they were really young, Haven and Landon, maybe three and five. They didn't have any teeth yet. Maybe it was two, two and four years old. But taking them to the grocery store and then trying to wheel them down the cart with a cart and down the aisles and they just put their hands out and they just kind of <laughs> throw everything in the in the carts. And one of the things that we 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 had to uh, be able to distract them um, was the only way to keep them from from doing the crazy stuff like that or putting stuff in the cart that we didn't see them put in and us buying it. And so one of the local grocery stores that we that we had gone to. Um, quite often they had these special carts that were like designed as like race cars and they had two steering wheels. And so there was room enough for both of them to sit side by side. And, and man, you know, it was like, they loved it. They would, they would just spin the wheels and, you know, the, the, the toothless grins, you know, it was kind of like two hamsters on espresso. <laughs> uh, so we took lots of pictures of them and, and, and everything. They were good memories, but yet, it kept them, you know, focused on what was going on. And, and I'm so thankful that, that, that those steering wheels weren't connected to the wheels of the cart. Because that would have been a mess. Complete disaster, right? Um, but what, what, I, what I'm getting into is, you know, the, the soul itself is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And, and pretty much all of those things are, are, are what gets us in trouble with this stuff, right? It's not just our, it's, it's our emotions and the hurt. Right, and then and and then we we don't deal with that hurt, and it festers, and we think about it so much that then our mind gets involved, and then of course then our will engages ourself, and we're, we become gods to ourselves. So, when you're looking at mind, will, and emotions, it's a complete soul area. You're devoid from God and and and, and everything. That part of us needs surrendered, and 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 I think it's Oswald Chambers that writes, what, "What's the absolute surrender?" Is that not Andrew. Andrew Murray? Oh man, good book. Absolute surrender. It takes the surrender of the mind and the questions and saying, "Lord, give it over. I just give it over to you. I don't have the answers, but I know you do." It's the it's the emotions 
when you come to this church, this is what we deal with. We, you know, we, because we've seen all of this happen before. We start up here, we stay up here. <laughs> you fall down a little bit and you go up, up, I receive forgiveness. And you stay in that indicative mood and that abiding. That's where we want to stay, right? And of course, then there's the, the will person, the will people, and the things that our will. You know, Satan wants our will too. God wants our will. Satan wants our will. It must be really important. Surrender is the prerequisite of any true victory that you will ever have in the Christian life. It is giving God the keys to that car. Basically, all of it. Mind, will, emotions. It's actively participating. It's not doing nothing. It's not sitting back, surrendering, as, you know, I give up, you know, that kind of thing. It's really actively participating and handing over and, and, and making sure that you are continually doing that and, let, and allowing things and letting go of stuff. It's work. It really is. Um, the good part about it is God does most of it for us, according to what? Philippians 2.13. There's two things in this process that will completely hinder surrender in our lives. One is fear. Fear of the three U's for once. Yeah, I mean, for one, um, that we talked about before. And that also is, could be the fear of man, or fear, whatever it is that you're afraid of. Fear will stop, stop you from being able to surrender because we put that wall up like we always talk about, right? The flesh wall. The soul and pride. Knowing is what matter, and I know best. Or I have to know more before I make that decision to, to, to lay down my, my life for the Lord. Those two things basically violate our terms of service, our terms of surrender, I guess I should say. Um, they void our warranty, so to speak, right? They cause you to grab the steering wheel and mess with the transmission and do it, you know, and nobody likes a backseat driver, right? Especially God. But thankfully, his mercies are new every morning. Amen. As long as we still have breath in us, his mercy is still moving. And we have an opportunity to surrender our lives fully to him at any moment, at any one step that we are, no matter how far down the rabbit hole we go. Amen. According to Oswald Chambers, and this is where I got his name, <laughs> true surrender is not simply surrender of our external life, but surrender of our will. And once that's done, surrender is complete. The greatest crisis that we ever face is the surrendering of our will. But yet, God never forces a person into surrender, and he never begs. He patiently waits until that person willingly yields or gives way to him. And then once that battle's been fought, it doesn't need to be fought again. Come to me and I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It's only after we've begun to experience that sal what salvation really means that when we surrender our will to Jesus, we are in rest and we have peace. Whatever is causing us a sense of uncertainty is actually a call to our will. Come to me. And it is a voluntary coming. You do it. You have to make that choice. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. You have to make the choice. Not only, you know, you, you, can, you can look at yourself and say, but I still don't have my answers to my whys. Your choice is still there, whether you drop it or not. True surrender is a, matter, <clears throat> is a matter of being united together with him in the likeness of his death until nothing ever appeals to you that doesn't appeal to him. The answers to your why questions. After you surrender, then what? Well, after you do it and you're, and you're actually walking and you're abiding, um, there actually becomes a building up of your spirit, man, to a point where you're, you have an eagerness to maintain the unbroken fellowship with him. I don't want anything to come between that anymore. I know where that led to. Oh, it's so awesome. I mean, it's, it's awesome. I, 
I, I can't go into too much of my testimony at all, but I am this person. And you know what? A lot of us have a really screwed up, messy middle. John Mark even did, but he ended up writing one of the Gospels. It's, it, we all have that. One of the most, I mean, the, the common thing that we have with people that are in deconstruction mode or disbelief or even atheists, we were all image bearers of a God that created us. We were created and we were purchased. We were doubly owned. We were created and we were purchased with a price. We were doubly owned. The other thing that is, is that we're all sinners and we've all fallen short, all of us. And now you might say, oh, there's some really nasty atheists out there that are, don't, I don't think they look like God at all. We were all created in his image. And we all have a chance. We all are always given the grace in order to be able to move from here to there. Thank God, because I'm one of them. <laughs> Has anyone ever gotten those emails that, that say our terms of use have changed? You know, and they, they make you read through 80 pages of, please, please, you know, go through this before I delete the suckers. You know, I just, I can't, you know, there's probably some really terrible things in it that I probably shouldn't agree to, but legally, I guess they got to do it all the time because it changes, like everything changes all the time and I get all these emails and text messages and and I'm sure you guys do too. <clears throat> They're only, you know, slightly less prominent than those, you know, you need to switch your car insurance. Your, 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 you know, your warranty has overlapsed. <laughs> Even if you don't have a car, you get those calls, right? <laughs> when we receive Christ as Lord, one of the first things that I learned is when I, when I, was, when I came back here, when I came to here in Kingdom Life Church and with dad and Jennifer was that my life is not my own. I thought, oh, I was born again. We do our life together. God is with me all the time. You know, I do my thing and he, no, our life is not our own anymore. That was the whole, that's the whole purpose. I give you my life. <laughs> live to live with, for you and serve you all the days of my life. Um, we sometimes forget and we start picking up, you know, grabbing the wheel and trying to drive ourselves somewhere else. But the reality of it is that, you know, our life is not our own. Our terms of use have changed, right, at that point. On our terms, <clears throat> just like I'm not interested in all the terms of service notices that I get or, or buying that extended warranty for my coverage of my car that I don't even have, <clears throat> God's not interested in our terms of surrender. He's only interested in his terms of surrender. What does that mean? Well, first of all, they can't have any conditions. When we surrender our heart and when we, we surrender our lives, there can be no conditions. I, I'll, I will surrender, but I don't want to give up this because, you know, that's too mean or that's too hard to walk the Christian life like that. Um, and there can't be any exclusions. Things that, I, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to show him that. I'm, I'm going to keep that off to the side. Um, no conditions, no exclusions. For absolute surrender to begin, we must be at least willing to be willing. And I know you've heard this from the pulpit before, but I think it's so good that maybe we're not fully prepared to be willing to go at this. And this seems like a lot of work. And maybe, I mean, there's a lot of life that happened, you know, in this from, from here to here. Lots of life happened, especially like C.S. Lewis. That was, he was nine years old when it started up here. And then he was a grown adult by this time. So, yeah, a lot of life happens. I don't expect an overnight changes or anything like that. Sometimes God can do it. But it's, it really is just relaxing and opening up to the possibility in prayer that, hey, I, I could be wrong about some things that I'm thinking. It's required by God. Unfortunately, the surrender part is, and some people don't like to hear that. Um, 
but I think this was actually out of Andrew Murray's book. Absolute surrender is required. The good news is that God accomplishes it himself. He completes it on his own, if we allow him. God accepts it fully known and fully loved. And if we allow him, God maintains it. And that's surrender. He does a lot of the work for us if we allow him to. Psalm 138, 7 and 8 says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will keep me alive. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish, complete what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hand. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. I love it. You could just go into that scripture and just soak in it for Philippians 2.13, right? For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. What brings him the most pleasure, he will be, out, he will be doing for you. <laughs> if you have only come as far as asking God for things, you have never come to the point of understanding the least bit of what surrender really means. Oswald Chambers. And what does that, what does he mean there? It's because through relationship you learn surrender. You learn trust through surrender. And a lot of people, if you don't trust God, you could ask him, you could pray for him until you're blue in the face for stuff. Just like he's the magic, you know, vending machine in the sky. But if you don't have relationship, you don't know what you're doing. So we need to be able to surrender that junk food, that 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 wayward thinking and focus more on relationship and building trust. First Corinthians eight verse one. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. What would you rather have? A fat head? Or to actually be built up? The one who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the one who loves God is known by him. That's cool. The rest of that verse. The one who thinks he knows something doesn't know what he ought to know. Which is what? Relationship. But the one who loves God, relationship, is known by him. As Lewis continued to wrestle with his beliefs, he experienced an internal struggle. He later described that moment as his, well, it was his conversion moment as reluctant, almost painful. He wrote, you must picture me alone in that room night after night feeling whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. <laughs> his intellect could no longer resist the realization that his heart was drawn to the idea of God, the very source that he rejected. This was a moment of surrender. Lewis had reached the end of his own reasoning, and that's where we need to be, and admitted in the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. <laughs> His words capture the reluctance and the vulnerability of a letting go of control. And yet this was the breakthrough that he needed in that humble surrender. He moved from the reliance on self to dependence on God. That's where he became exposed to God. Encountering God's presence, moving from knowledge to relationship. Why do I exist? Oh, one of the best why questions. Why is the sky blue? You know, the, the kids start young. Why, why, why? It drives us nuts sometimes, but hey, at least they're inquisitive. Why do I exist? Two reasons. 
I'll give you two. I'm sure there's plenty. For God's glory and to glorify him as an image bearer of our creator. To love him, to serve him, to magnify him. And two, to know him. To fellowship. No matter our vocation or our titles or our job descriptions, no matter our life circumstances that are thrown our way, all we were created by God to do was to love Him, serve Him, know Him in all of those circumstances. On that job that you don't like or in the hardships of life and the different losses that we've had, to know Him was why we're here. God earnestly desires our fellowship. I know I've talked about this before, but it's one of my favorites. That scripture where it says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. James 4, 6 through 10. It says, <clears throat> I'll abbreviate a little bit. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then it goes on to say, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And so what I saw there, while we're talking about slimming down the waistline of our overweight brain, was a humble sandwich. Let me tell you what I see. It's, it's a humble sandwich. It's God's earnest desire. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's his earnest desire for fellowship, but it's sandwiched in between two Exhortations to humility. Humble yourself and he will draw near to you if you draw near to him. And then again, he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. A humble sandwich. <laughs> this, of course, is a very good reason, according to Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits the <clears throat> eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Listen to this. With him who has a contrite and humble spirit. A high and holy place, huh? I don't feel high and holy most of the time. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I'm walking my daily routine, <laughs> I don't feel high and holy. But if we, if we pay attention and fellowship and build that relationship with him, we humble ourselves so that we could draw near to him and he draws near to us. We humble ourselves again in his sight. We don't know. Yes, we, 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 the meaning we, we don't fully understand or grasp the relationship that we have, but we want to grow in it. That's the humility part. Humble yourselves and he'll raise you up. whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. I love that verse. As we search through the scriptures, we find those who walked in the greatest understanding of God's ways were the ones who through humility pursued fellowship with him and they experienced his presence. The ones with the greatest understanding of God's ways were the ones that pursued fellowship with him. After Lewis's initial, <clears throat> initial surrender, faith, his faith journey continued as he shifted from mere belief in God to a personal relationship. And see, there's the shift here between, between unbelief to belief that, that could be just intellect, something that he couldn't, he couldn't deny the missing element that was needed and said, well, only God could fill it, so God must exist. But this is all still intellect. It wasn't until he decided that Christianity was actually uh, something that he brought you back to the, the indicative mood which brought you into the fruit of the Spirit and everything, in relationship with Him was the only way. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the Son has risen. And he later wrote after that, not only because I see the Son, I see it, 
but because by it I see everything else. That's profound, isn't it? That's why I believe in Christianity, he says. With this revelation, Lewis's faith deepened, shifting from just an intellectual ascent to a relationship grounded in the love of God. And trust and wonder came back. No, I don't have all the answers, but I'm, but I'm in awe and wonder of the God who does. Lewis's journey back to faith was not a return to blind belief. Rather, it was a reformation. It was a rebuilding that took into account his doubts, his intellect, and the longing for joy. He wrote that God shattered my need for security. Amen. He could do that. That's like a legitimate need of security. And God could fill it. He taught him to look to him for every breath. This was a faith grounded in humility. Acknowledging that he did not have all the answers, but that he trusted the one who did. I keep saying that because I love it. Through this particular journey, Lewis found peace. The peace that he was searching for that surpasses all understanding. A faith that embraced both the mind and the heart. And he moved from the weight of demanding answers to the freedom of trust. From the darkness of doubt to the light of hope. His story reminds us that our journey back to faith may require humility, surrender, and willingness to see our questions as just paths towards a relationship with God and growth rather than barriers to belief. His story of deconstruction and reformation teaches us that the journey of faith often involves cycles of questioning and surrender. His longing for joy, his intellectual wrestlings, and his eventual surrender all became the foundation for a reformed faith that embraced the mystery and majesty of God. Just as Lewis found his way back to faith, we too can find hope, not in having every answer, but in trusting the one who does. Amen? I, after studying several people who've gone through this, and talking to people who are in the process of, found that the basic overall picture of the pathway home is in these three steps. Five steps. I'm going to give you two more extra ones. No, it's, it was five steps. I said three, right? <laughs> five steps to the pathway home. The exposure to God is... is uh, one of the most important things. That doesn't take anything except for realizing that God can, can exist, basically. Re realizing and allowing God to see your pain, the, the, uh, the anger, the, uh, the, the questions, and acknowledging the doubts to Him. It's being exposed to God. Like, I'm not fully knowing where I'm going to go with this, Lord, and, and I just... Even if you don't, I mean, you you have to exist. You you have to exist, you know, in that in that process. You have to be humble enough to actually get to that point to acknowledge the pain. I have pain. I have questions. It's when you decide to not blame God for all of the the issues or blame people. It's just getting real before God and say, "Hey, I got pain." It's part of the human experience. It's, yeah, we all do but we have to acknowledge it. Acknowledge number one. The second one, seek genuine community. Find a mentor or a church that disciples. We have a discipling church. You know the difference between discipling and discipline? Not much. When you're raising kids and you say, well, you know, I punish a kid for running across the street or, you know, whatever, we have punishments. A lot of people are thinking punishment, this is God, is God is punishing me, you know. No, he has taken all the punish, punishment. He's taken our, our, our sin, our shame, our punishment is, is done, right? So we don't punish children when we're, when we're talking about raising children. We don't punish them because they did such and such. We discipline. You know what discipline means? Broke it down. That part is to, to raise up, to grow, to train. Discipline. It doesn't mean 
slapped them on the wrist or whatever. Sometimes, I mean, spare the rod, spoil the child. It's also in the scriptures. <laughs> you know, when they're young, they're too young to understand why they shouldn't be running around in the street. Yeah. Um, but a disciplining church is one that trains up, that equips. We're one. There aren't very many. But if you could find one, that would be the second thing. Acknowledge your pain. Seek genuine community. Whether it's a small group or a support group or somebody that would mentor you, somebody that would hold you accountable or a group that would hold you accountable, like we have an accountability group for the guys, um, which is excellent. Now, C.S. Lewis had what, what they called, uh, the, the, at the time, it was called the Inklings. And that's where he met J.R.R. Tolkien, Tolkien um, in his group in Oxford that, they, that was just like a little side group that lasted. It lasted for like 20 years you know, in the school. But that's where he got to know him. And J.R.R. Tolkien spoke to him about Jesus. And he began to question himself as to how he was thinking. Maybe I wasn't thinking all that. Maybe I can... Maybe I was wrong. You begin to doubt your doubts, right? Number three, embrace your intellectual and spiritual humility. Begin to doubt your doubts. The moment when a person begins to question their doubts, they open up to the possibility that they might be wrong. That's what happened to me when I got here. I didn't think like any of these people, but you know what? They had joy. Same as this guy. All these people, these people lived in joy and had good relationships, and they didn't think anything like I did. I began to doubt my thinking, doubt my own doubts. Recognize the limits of your human understanding and open up to the mysteries of God. As Lewis found, he moved from a place of intellectual certainty to one of humility. And that allowed him for a softened heart that could accept the presence and the reality of God without all the answers that he originally wanted. Humility, right? Number four, surrender control. Let go of the need for the full understanding and control of everything around you. A significant part of his journey was that he surrendered his self-reliance and admitted that God is God. This act of surrender invites God to move and work in ways that may go beyond human reasoning. In five, rediscover the living God through experience, not just intellectual and emotional. I mean, not just intellectual, emotions. you got to experience them in your emotions. It's the fruit of the Spirit They're all the God emotions. Move from that mindset that relies solely on reason to one that seeks personal relationship. This always involves dealing with emotions. When we open up our heart to him, we just allow him to take away our pain, the pain of the hurt, the pain of the fear, and the things that cause guilt, anger, shame, you know, all the hell flags. When we do that, we allow him to we allow ourselves to begin to experience Him and His presence in abiding. And we move back into that indicative mood where we experience rest and the peace of God. Amen? The fruit of the Spirit. C.S. Lewis' journey shifted when he encountered God, not just as an idea, but a real personal presence. Seek out moments of tire, you know, of time that you can pray alone, worship. Think about your nurturing your intimacy with God. Do your 60-day challenge. Do your daily routine. I know a lot of you do here. But if you're ever struggling with these types of things, when, when 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 we're stuck in our messy middle, if we would just give it up by humility, really. I don't know it all, and I might not ever. But you know what? God does. And I need, I need him to fill everything in my heart that I feel is missing. I cannot fill that with, with stuff of this world. Not everybody ends well. And I, and I wish it, it, you know, it was that way, that everybody could find their way back. 
but I'm hoping that at least those five simple steps could keep us on the right path and help us share. At least if you knew somebody that's in the process of they're doubting and they're deconstructing and what have you, to be able to share, you know, a little bit of insight, but yet the, the you know, um, at least you would know how to pray. If it's you who are struggling, you know, it all, it's all about relationship. It's about humility. It's about surrender. Um, and it doesn't take a lot. Like I said, God is willing to do most of the heavy lifting for us. And I think that one of the things that I, I learned in the process is everybody and everybody's situation is different. The pathway back might look, not look exactly the same for everyone. And you might meet people that are, you know, in these areas down here, but yet, you know, there's some people that, that are determined to stay here, to be unchurched, to, to be, you know, bitter towards God. And, and you know what, they'll, they'll come to you and they ask questions. And their questions are, are just for, for reasons to exit. Their, their, their questions are tricks. And you don't want to deal with those people. They're already set. Their heart is hardened. I mean, their heart is hardened. But there are people that are asking questions legitimately for truth because they want answers. And those are the people that we can help them get to that point. Amen? Let me, let, me, let me pray. I'll close in prayer. Let's just bow our heads. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we become just before you, Lord, in, in, in gratitude for the series and the things that you're teaching us so that we are able to not just help ourselves, of course, but to be able to speak into other people's lives, to help comfort them. Um, let us, let us lead us into those areas, Lord, that we have doubts. And Father, help us doubt those doubts so that we could surrender control to you, so that we could get the answers that you want to you provide through your wisdom and your love. Lead us to rediscover that not just you know through the intellect, but I want to I want to rediscover Jesus in an intimate way and and developing that relationship where we could sit across the table from each other and read the scriptures that you spoke. As we conclude this series Let's leave our hearts open and ready to say yes to his call, understanding that our journey is not about finding answers to our why questions, but it's about discovering you, Father, the one who knows all the answers. Lead us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.